Three, two, one. Here we go. Welcome back, Mad Tropolis. What a week! Wow, some of y'all had hurricanes. Some of you had hurricanes at work. I know the freight world this week was insane. So we made it. Happy Friday. Danny's in the house. John's in the house. Tim Pool. It's so nice to see everybody. Uh, okay. What's everybody drinking? Put your beer in the comments. Or if you're listening to music, don't forget to put your music in the comments as well. Ease of delivery is here. What is this? Ithaca Beer Co. Flower Power. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's a little hoppy though um india pale ale or something andrew teal would yell at me about this i probably use the wrong terminology i just drink the beer people i'm not a beer expert <laughs> <laughs> um so just wanted to let everyone know that you can find all the episodes on youtube i know a lot of people like to watch on linkedin but you can always go to youtube mad games live and you can see all the past episodes and learn some shit people you can also go to my website madgainslive.com m a d g a i n e s live.com all right let's get started let's introduce our wonderful guest john we are so excited to have you and i want to tell you Interestingly enough, that you were brought to my attention by some of my Canadian followers. And I was like, Canadian? Interesting. <laughs> and I'm, you know, still learning uh, the industry and different companies. And I knew about your company, but I didn't know that you had such a heavy Canadian following. So what's what's that all about? Because you're yeah, based well, in Atlanta, right? <laughs> well, well we're, we were based in uh, Montreal uh, as well as Atlanta. So we have a U.S. headquarters as well as a uh, work a, a Canadian corporation uh, and uh, the founders uh, at FLS, uh, FLS is over 30 year old company. The founders grew the business, uh, sold it in 2016 to uh, Avery Partners, which is a PE firm uh, out of Boston, who's our owner today. And, um, you know, they worked with the owners, uh, the founders for a couple of years, uh, ultimately, uh, decided to make a change. I had uh, a relationship with Avery from my telecom days, and uh, they knew I was at Coyote and uh, reached out and said, "Would I be interested in doing this?" And it's been uh, it's been a really great uh, it's been a great ride so far. Yeah, how was that shift going from Coyote? How long were you at Coyote for? Uh, almost four years. Okay, and then where were you before that? Were you even in freight? I was not. I was in telecom uh, my whole wow. career prior to that. So yeah, it was uh, it was interesting um, when I interviewed with Coyote. You know, Jeff Silver uh, hired me. Made uh, he made it clear that he was looking for someone from outside the industry uh, mm. and uh, with a different perspective. And uh, um, so I worked uh, uh, kind of helping to lay the foundation for you know being able to build a sales organization out even bigger than it was. Coyote was about. You know, 1.8 billion when uh, I started, and we were going to uh, myself and a COO were hired. We were going to the plan was to take the company public and started planning to do that. And then uh, surprise, as most <laughs> as most folks know, UPS came came in and, and offered uh, a lot of money, and uh, it, and that was great. Uh, UPS, you know, let us continue to run the business. So I got to you know learn, uh, but it was really neat that what what Jeff did in hiring me. Um, he for the first two months, two and a half months, really, I came into the organization as an entry level new hire. So I went through the new hire program, uh, was mm -hmm. taught freight, was able to not get, um, you know, bogged down by what my real job would be as chief commercial officer until I had a good idea of, you know, the business. And, and not that you can learn this business in two months, but two and a half months. But I, you know, I went through the new hire training, which was all, you know, in the classroom for 30 days. Then I went on to the floor as a as a entry level carrier rep and, and worked on uh, uh, booking loads and uh, learning to deal with carriers. And yeah, so it was really it was really neat, you know, working side by side, uh, these brand new hires. And I have I have kids older than uh, a lot of them. And uh, they were teaching me everything, uh, you know, this old dog didn't know. And uh but it was really a great way to come into the business and learn and then be able to at least, you know, be able to walk and chew gum 
while I uh, while I learned the business, uh, you know, working with these large customers. So Coyote was a great experience. What did you think about the freight world your first few months? It was. Um, he sighs you know, the, first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, the things that, that was good. That was a good response. A big sigh. <laughs> <laughs> the things that attracted me about it were were that number one, um, you know, Coyote was was actually you know very compelling. You know, uh, one of the best brokerages out there was when, when I when I left Telecom, uh, I had a non compete and, and and I couldn't compete. Uh, uh, I had a contract for for a year, so I was just figuring out you know where else I would want to go and coyote offered an opportunity to go into something that had scale it was you know as we said you know pre uh, public we, that was exciting i'd been a ceo of a small publicly traded company in telecom um and so it was really a neat opportunity the, the and, and the things about the industry that surprised me were you know the size the scale the you know growing faster the gdp um you know so really really neat business anybody that's in telecom knows you know, telecoms going the other way. You're you're replacing outdated, uh, high margin technology with um, you know, inexpensive, low margin technology. So for for legacy companies, it's difficult to you know really get the growth engine going. And in in this business, it, it's not. And we're seeing that this year, you know, particularly. Was there any time where you were like, "What the hell have I agreed to"? Uh, but every three weeks I do that. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> You're like, what is going on? Yeah. I, uh, I, I, um, you know, the business is, you know, especially our business now, um, you know, we're, we're almost 600 million in, in revenue. So, you know, good size. Uh, we've grown, we, we've done one acquisition. We're, we're going to try, uh, to get at least one and potentially two closed before the end of this year. Um, but you know, the, the cyclicality of the business was really the biggest change for me. Telecom, yep. you know, in recessions and in good times is, is pretty stable. You also know when you sign a three-year contract in telecom, what the costs are going to be, what the, what the uh, revenues are going to be. And, and that's stable in this business, you know, you sign a, you know, do a year RFP. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's much more volatile, much more, um, difficult to, to gauge, but we've got, you know, we've got a great CFO um, that, you know, really does a, a nice job helping us forecast the business as well as uh, managing the, the financial side of the business. And that's really important. I think it was interesting. I talked to um, one of the most famous shippers, uh, Ron Kane. Uh, he used to be famous in the beer world, then he went to Monster yeah. and now he's doing flatbed. And one of the things that he used to get so frustrated from a high level shipper position is um, all over the supply chain, he was able to predict his costs and things were pretty stable, but he's like, but the transportation portion was so volatile. It didn't make any sense to me. Like every year, everybody knew Christmas was coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every year Christmas is all fucked up. Yeah. Um, it's like, it was just so odd about our industry. And maybe that's what some of us are so addicted to is the volatility and the excitement. Yeah. Like, like you really have to ride out the waves. Um, I think that right now we're at a, some of us are at a wave where we just got to like make as much money and close those deals and, and have fun. And we like, you never know what's around the corner. Uh, oh. it could be something like last, last summer. Um, I see, I see Matt Fink is in the house. I love Matt Fink. We gotta get you on the show one day, Matt Fink. Ron King, <laughs> famous or infamous. Good point, Matt. I saw a couple other people. Um, someone said, let's see, John uh, said he's drinking he's drinking a German Pilsner. Ooh. Rhonda's in the house. Chris Gaines, my little brother, who's in Atlanta working for JB Hunt. He's in the house. Hey Chris. Uh, <laughs> and then there is an inquiry on the jersey behind you uh-huh what what uh i'm not uh I, I okay i do have my glasses on but i still can't see <laughs> it's uh, uh patrick kane blackhawks uh signed jersey and hockey stick i don't know if you can see the, the hockey sticks right underneath it um blackhawks. got to do uh got to do some uh work and charity stuff with the blackhawks when i was in chicago i lived in chicago when i was at coyote and uh jeff silver's big big hockey uh Big hockey fan is, and does a lot of uh, good work with uh, some of the younger uh, teams in Chicago. But 
he had a good affiliation with the Blackhawks. We did some uh, work with them, and I got to play golf with Patrick Kane, and uh, I got a signed jersey out of it and a uh, hockey stick. So that, that's uh, that adorns my uh, home office. I swear I didn't bring up Ron Kane because of that, or maybe I did. <laughs> Emily, Ron was speaking to me through that. Um, he's, he's always ignoring me, anyhow. But I love it. Uh, Daniel Stanton's in the house too. Hi, Daniel. We missed you last week, or maybe you did come last week. I can't remember. Blackhawks, Chicago hockey. So, are do you know how to ice skate? I do. I uh, I grew up in Corning, New York, so uh, oh, yeah, uh, played, right. played hockey. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, had, we had a lot of snow and uh, ice and. Uh, had a little pond uh, in a park close to my house, so we used to have uh, you know, make up uh, hockey games at night and, and go play and uh, played a little bit of uh, of um, you know regulation hockey as well. But uh, uh, all kinds of sports growing up, so that was fun growing up in uh, in Western New York. Got to play all kinds of sports. Do they still fight in hockey? Do they still like <laughs> throw down their gloves and get in a fight because isn't that like no other sport? Oh yeah, fighting like a thing. They do. They, they 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 continue to, uh, and they're not and they're not looking to to regulate that so that they won't. No, they're going to continue to allow that. At least everyone who knows goes into professional hockey. They're like, all right, I better learn how to fight because this is real. Mm -hmm. I'm have to throw it down sooner or later. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was when I was playing, you know, forty years ago, guys weren't as big as they are now. Guys now are gigantic yeah. in hockey, and yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a rough sport. Which is weird because you actually you would think you'd have smaller um, uh, players so that they're faster uh, in hockey, but yeah. it's kind of like moving the exact opposite way than I would think. Yeah, and you still do. You still got you still got a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, folks that are smaller, uh, but uh, but the the defense and and you know they're just you know just gigantic now. So. Philip says that's why everyone goes to hockey games. Lots of dentists would be out of work if they started to regulate. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> Probably sponsored by dentists. <laughs> All right, a little rabbit hole there. I'm sorry about that. Um, talk to me about. Uh, well, first of all, what, what, how was it go making the switch from Coyote to FLS, um, and and then also moving because you said I think you said you're in Atlanta now, right? I am. Yeah. I moved from, uh, moved from Chicago to Atlanta. Um, yeah. So, you know, when, when I left, uh, Coyote, uh, we're over 3 billion in revenues. Um, obviously we, we did a lot of work with, with, with UPS, uh, and, uh, so got to see, you know, the inner workings of, of, you know, that, you know, Goliath of a company as well. And, and I had worked with some, multi-billion dollar telecom companies in, in, in the day as well. So I, I had a good experience with small companies as well as uh, large. Um, yeah, but, the, but the change from, you know, Coyote was very established, uh, had, had really good technology, obviously a lot of great experienced people up and down uh, the management and, and, and sales and, and carrier sales ranks. So uh, when I came to FLS, FLS was um, obviously a lot smaller. Um, knew they needed to, that we needed to change the technology. Um, wanted to really add some foundational things that would allow the company to grow from where it was to the size it is now. Plus, you know, uh, get to a billion dollars. And, and and you know, those are some things that um, you know, that you have to do that some people, frankly, um, in the business don't want to do. They want it to be the old way. And uh, and so we had, you know, we had some turnover as, as we went through that. But we also attracted a lot of uh, good new folks. And, and um, you know, we have really great tenure, you know, throughout the sales organization, particularly our top 10 reps um, are all very, very tenured. And, uh, you know, we've got a great team in Montreal, uh, a lot of back office folks that, that, are, that are there. Our IT team is, is predominantly there. And, uh, and then we've got executives that, uh, you know, are in the, uh, uh, in the United States as well as uh, Canada. So, um, but the, the, the having to do the, the things as a CEO versus, you know, being the chief commercial officer in Coyote mm -hmm. and having, you know, all of the support, you know, there, it, it's, it's different. And, and, you know, you realize really quickly in this business, if you don't plan correctly, you can get caught up in one of those cyclical downturns and, and it mm -hmm. makes life really difficult. So one of the things that, that, that we're doing now, you know, gotten much better at forecasting, 
um, really uh, confident in, in you know, a, a, as good a view as you can have on where the business is and where the business is going. And then that helps educate us as we think about acquisitions and, and you know, our debt load and do we want to, you know, how, how can we do a deal and, and, and make it make sense in the, the good times, but also allow us to, you know, weather the, uh, the cyclical downturns and, you know, and in that, I got to say that, you know, Abri has been just a great partner, our, our PE firm. They, you know, they were incredibly supportive during the, uh, you know, 2019, which is a really rough year. Um, we made a lot of changes, uh, all building a foundation that, that would allow us to grow as the market turned. And, and that really, you know, has happened. And, and so our growth has been off the charts, so, you know, like a lot of the brokerages have over the course of the last you know, 16, 17 months. And, uh, yeah. and is, that Abri, is that, is that Canadian or is that here? Abri's in Boston. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, US, they're a U.S. firm. Yep. I was just curious. Cause I'm always curious. Wait, 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 before I get into my curiosity, Daniel has a great question because Daniel, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, he would love to hear about some of the changes that the old school team members had a hard time accepting. Well, yeah, so that's a great question. The, 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 the you know, the, there are, there are people that, you know, that had an incredible tenure with FLS. As I said, it was over 30 years old. And there were a number of people that had been there for 15, 20, 25 years. So, you know, when you when you're around, you know, the same leadership and everything was really, you know, it was focused in, in Montreal. Uh, most of the, the executive team was in Montreal. And, you know, now you've got a, a U.S. PE firm that comes in and, now you change out the 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 CEO for a U.S. based CEO. You know, they're, they're, people are wondering what's going on. Right. And you know, one of the Is things our company going to turn into a bunch of capitalists. Oh <laughs> so, no! The, 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 you know, the ugly Americans. And uh, <laughs> and we, you know, listen. We 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 when we came in, we said, you know, we're going to be transparent. We're going to talk to you about everything that we're doing. You know, we did we do town halls. We do you know we instituted a newsletter. We did a number of different communication things that you know really gave what we feel like um, our employee base a, a really good sense of what's going on and and um, but but to answer the, the question finally there are just there are people that that want it the old way and won't believe that you know the changes could necessarily be good for the business and just want to you know want to do something else and so um, you know they did and in this business there are a lot of other places to go and, I have uh, to be very careful myself, get, not getting caught up because now I'm coming on a, over a decade being in this industry. And I find myself like looking at companies that are all young and sexy. And I'm like, oh, come on. It's like, it's just brokerage. Get down and grind. Let's do it. Like, who cares about your sexy marketing and blah, blah, blah. But I find myself doing something like a little bit similar. And even as a leader in my past life, the thing I hated the most hearing, which sometimes I say, hey, shut up, Andrew Teal, I see that, is um, they, first <laughs> of all, that happens all the time, is they like to say, well, you're still new to freight, and I've been in this industry for 30 years, and da 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 da, -da, -da. That's the one that gets me all the time. And then the other one is, we've been doing it this way for 30 years. We've never had a problem. We've never mm -hmm. did da, 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 or it's always worked. Da, 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 da. And those were usually the two sentences that I cringe when I hear. I'm like, ah, I don't yeah. know if I should cringe, but I do. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, te you know, technology in this business was really, you know, Jeff Silver was way ahead of his time in terms of technology. I mean, a lot of the things that a lot of the uh, digital brokers, you know, are talking about or we're talking about even two, three years ago, Coyote was doing. Um, and the, and, and so the technology component of this business is, is, is still new to a lot of people. One of the things that it wasn't new to me, I came out of technology uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the telecom business. So I, I recognize how important it is that you have technology that's going to allow you to, to be, be as efficient as, as all these other folks. And uh, so we really focused on, on, on implementing that. And it's allowed us to, to do uh, a lot more with the same amount of people and that, you know, that that's and, and do things more quickly. So we're, you know, we have a platform that we're continuing to develop, but we feel, uh, you know, we feel really good about, um, you know, that foundation and uh, our ability to continue to develop it. 
Um, uh, hold on one minute. I want to make sure that John, I think you hit on John's question. How important has it been keeping up with technology? Ben, oh no. How important has uh, keeping up with your technology been in enabling growth? Um, and I want to add one more thing onto it. Do you think that technology is just kind of blown out of proportion and people just need to grind it out and be good salespeople and blah, blah, blah? Well, I, I think you can. And we do we do a lot of that. You know, we, we've got a lot of folks that are, are, are grinding it out every day. What technology does is allows you to be more efficient. You know, with back office processes, uh, you know, book more loads with the same amount of people, you know, provide better service through visibility and, and, and letting folks know where, where their freight is in a very timely way. You know, it's all those things. And the thing about technology that, that people that, you know, poo-poo it don't realize is that by the time you, you realize that you need it for a lot of people, it's too late. Because it, yeah. it's, you know, everyone's, everyone's already got the momentum for being, you know, and it, yeah. but it's not cheap. It's an investment. You have to make the investment in the business uh, to, to grow it. But the, uh, um, but, but technology is very important. And it, and it, you know, most people think, oh, technology, you know, implementing technology means you're just going to cut people out of the company and, and, and nothing could be further for the truth. We implement technology so that we can do a lot more business and allow people to make a lot more money with the same amount of people. And that's what it's allowing us to do. So, so that, that's the way we think about it and, and why we'll continue to uh, develop it and, uh, um, and, and grow. But we, yeah, we, we still do. Yeah, we still do. Um, we still grind it out. We, we, you know, we, we, we hey, drive. Got to, man. You just got yeah, to you have to. Work. That, that's the business. Yeah. I mean, your technology can be all sexy and great, but you got to fuck around and do work. Uh, there's yeah. one more question than I thought was really I saw something good. about yeah a loose market and a tight market and I uh, did um I I think that was a follow-up to Matt Fink's question um about a variability in forecasting do you remember that one Zeke Zeke will find it he always does doesn't the variability oh there we go see he's so fast doesn't the variability in forecasting terrify you how far do you look when building forecasts and outlooks and Matt I thought the same thing when he was like, oh, our CFO forecast. And I was like, <clears throat> hmm, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah listen, we, we, First we, of all, let me tell yeah, you we, about that CFO. we <laughs> use as many inputs as, as we possibly can because it is a inexact science, you know, and that's an understatement. Um, you know, I got a chance to, to, to meet a lot of smart people, you know, at Coyote. So that gave me a really nice, uh, bench of folks that I can bounce ideas off of and make sure my thoughts are or our thoughts are, you know, similar to theirs. Um, and then using, you know, all the other different uh, communications that uh, come out and forecasts that come out. And, and then, you know, use a lot of our history and look at how we did in certain cycles that, you know, um, were similar to the cycle that we're in and, and, and what was the, you know, upside of that or the downside of that. And, and, and so it's a, it, it's really, you, you've got to get a feel for it. We, we, you know, we did a number of different things for the first year I was here to try and get a really good sense of it. Uh, we have a forecasting call with our branch directors every Thursday, which was unheard of uh, prior to me coming. And, um, Ooh, good and, idea. And, 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 and frankly, you know, when we started it, if we got within 35 or 40% of, uh, of a branch forecast, we were happy. And now, yeah. Uh, these these guys and gals that, that are forecasting every Thursday, they're forecasting within, you know, four or five percent of, of the number positively or negatively and have been doing that for over a year. So it's really a, a useful um, uh, activity for us to get a good sense of where we think the month is going to be starting at the beginning and then how it changes throughout the month. I want to point out Andrew Teal's opinion. I said IMO, Zeke. I saw it somewhere. Um, and, uh, and also Andrew, uh, could maybe enlighten us on how far ahead he likes to forecast. I know Andrew's always in the data and, um, okay. Oh yeah. In my opinion, get through a real tight and loose freight cycle. You're likely a vet of the industry. Good point, Andrew. Niches, niches have their own. Some people say niches. Some people say niches, <laughs> uh, or niche. I, I like that word. It's a good word. Uh, have their own things, of course, but that experience will serve you well for a long time. And Andrew, this is such a great point because so many people, um, when they're new to the industry, I always tell them the same thing. I'm like, watch out for how volatile it is. And then plan your, when you when you start feeling that volatility, 
So it is always capacity. Mm-hmm. And, and we're talking about full truckload folks, obviously. Yep. And, and, um, and when you see it turn toward or carriers favor and the capacity is tight and they get great, mar- they get great margins, great rates and them versus the brokers and shippers where capacity is loosened, plan your initiatives for those capacities too. So when I always wait around, I'm like, well, when capacity tightens, I want to do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. And when it loosens, I need to do this, this, and this. And yeah. I don't know, that's, that's really high level and like, yeah, I think it's, carry, but yeah. I think it's it's important that that you know you, you you treat shippers and carriers you know in a way that's as level-handed as, as you can be in the good and the bad, and mm-hmm. I think it's why we've got such a, a a dedicated group of carriers that work with us in both the U- United States and Canada because you know we're not gonna you know we're not going to abuse them in a uh, you know really uh, tight environment or uh, or loose environment. We're gonna you know try and be as fair as we can be. And, uh, and and it's, it's served us well. And I think it, it, it served the company well for a long time prior to me being there, but it's uh, it served us well uh, uh, in, in my time there. But it's so true because people, if people started in this business, you know, seven or eight months ago, they would think this is the easiest, best business that you could possibly be in because, you know, we just keep going up and up and up. But uh, no, that, it doesn't roll like that. People. No, people that were in people that were in this business in 2019 <laughs> know that. Yeah, it yeah, like it, it, it it can go down and down and down, and uh, that's that's yeah. painful. But you know, having a, a good sense of you know where that bottom may be, you know, protects mm-hmm. you from you know from being able to. Uh, you um, want to know what's really sad, John? Is I had to said I had to say this to somebody. I've never, I think. I think I started saying this in 2018, maybe. <laughs> this is horrible um, because it goes with volatility, but there's also volatility in your job people too, because I, so I have some people that I know and we're always talking and then there's some that are new to their industry. And I always tell them, you have to always be ready to be fired or laid off in this industry. It is something, I mean, I've worked in other industries, pharmaceutical, tobacco, law and now here i've never seen even the position volatility the employment volatility as it is here when we saw that a lot in 2020 right the second shit hit the fan in 2020 people are laying off everybody mm-hmm. and now they're hiring and scrambling and hiring and then they're like oh my god why can't i hire anybody oh probably because you treat them like shit and you laid them off That's <laughs> but yeah. the thing is is it, that was the other thing that I thought was so unique to our industry. Um, I see Craig Decker has a really couple of great points. I should bring it up in just a minute. But I saw one more. Um, give me one second. Somebody had a really great question. Um, give me one second, y'all. I saw somebody said that uh, something about nights. Okay. Uh, Mark, Cr- Mark Cummer. Um, do you feel a breeze technology leading PE footing? Oh, thank you, Zeke. In the comm sector, gave you a strategic advantage against competitors and innovation, given that there's little R and D in the industry, excluding Uber and Convoy. Ah, oh, Mark, who's Mark? Do you know Mark? <laughs> I can't uh, I... excluding Uber and Convoy. Mark, you and I are going to talk. talk about <laughs> there are companies that are dumping tons of money into R and D. Oh they yeah. Don't talk about it because they're competitors. I mean, yeah. shit. Some of these big competitors are their own think tanks. But go ahead, John. Yeah, like no, I think I, I think it I think it did. I think that you know coming out of a technology uh, environment, you know, let let me not only see how quickly new technology can displace old technology, um, and you know what what are the uh, what are the financial impacts of that. So um, it was really important, and and Abri recognized this as well. It's really important with me coming in that 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 we you know, laid out a technology roadmap that we could start uh, performing to so that we would be in a position from a technology standpoint to have all the things that we needed to be a, a $600 million freight brokerage and a billion dollar freight brokerage. And we've got a foundation that that, that we can do that now. And, and um, you know, we would have been in a much worse position if we didn't, especially with COVID and going remote, uh, mm-hmm. the, the old technology that we had mm-hmm. would, would have been very limiting in that regard. So, in uh, a way, COVID did us a favor as the industry. Yeah. I think it sure um, did. Yeah, this Andrew, is uh, Andrew Teal said, "I'm telling you guys, it's not my fault. I ask Andrew to come on my show all the time. I've asked him to co-host shows with me. He refuses me. I'm like a woman waiting by the phone. 
for a guy to call her. He says, I think there's a lot of R&D, but it's internal and proprietary. See, he says things better than me too. I mean, Amazon has a ton all the time, just aren't putting it out there yet as a product. Same with others, large shippers, et cetera. He is right. Mark says that his last name is pronounced Coomer. Now I'm going to make fun of you, Coomer. Yeah, uh, I saw you MIT. said he was the first, he's the first American employee of FLS in 2004, ironically enough, is what his Ooh. note was, which is, um, yeah, that, 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 that goes to show you how, uh, you know, and, and FLS was, was, you know, in Canada for, you know, many, many years before that. So it's been around a long time. Um, okay. Matt Fink said the same thing I thought. Where's Chris Gaines? JB Hunt is going haywire on tech. Come on, Chris Gaines, get in here. I know Chris, he's probably booking freight and cursing my name out. All right. Um, we have, we have gone over time as usual. I always freaking do this. John, I have a challenge for you. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hold on. Let me stretch it out. People. Oh, God. Mm. John, I want you to tell me one negative thing about Coyote. We didn't go public. No, that's not negative. That's not <laughs> negative. That was negative. <laughs> um, I, yeah, one negative thing about Coyote. Um, yeah, the, the, the most negative thing for me was, you know, we, we, you know, we had a great team and, and a great business and it, it, it would have been fun going public, uh, and, and growing the business and selling it, you know, so quickly into my tenure there was, was, you know, something that I wish didn't happen. That would be the, but I don't have, uh, I don't have any, uh, I have many bad things to say about the team there. And uh, I, I, I'm very thankful that, you know, they took a chance on me and, and allowed me to get some experience in this industry yeah, with, one of, with one of the best, you know, with one of the he best well uh, teams trade. in the business. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'd have a tough time saying anything negative. And I still got a lot of friends uh, over there. So we know you do. You've been dropping <laughs> the coyote, the Abbott, whatever, and the Jeff Silver bombs left and right. You have been very good for your company, too. Uh, usually, I would start squashing people on the head for that by now, but we like you. So um, <laughs> for any of those who want to say something bad about Coyote, Jeff Silver, or Abyss, is that what it's called? Go ahead and say in the comments, let's offset what John said, because we can't be too happy on this show because I'm miserable. And someone just said something about my grandmother's phone. This isn't my grandmother's phone. Look, I found it. At a yard sale, you guys. This is what I used to call John. And I said, hey, John, will you come? It's not my grandmother's phone, you assholes. All right, fine. Okay, next Friday we have CEO of, he always gets mad at me. I say YRC, but it's yellow now. I don't know. I say YRC because people still don't know what yellow is. Get it together. Let's figure it out. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great weekend, y'all. And don't forget to put your bad comments in there because you got to offset <laughs> John's happiness.